working through Revelation. If you're a guest, we've been in Revelation for quite a while, and we're almost done. And uh, we're going to pick it up today at uh, Revelation 19, verse 17, and then we're going to go through the entire chapter 20, uh, because it all fits together in one big uh, expression. And I want to tell you, as I share from this particular passage, that I'm not going to speculate. A lot of times people get into this passage and they have all kinds of speculations. And when you see the subject matter, you go, oh, that's why they do that. And he's right, they do. And my view is this, if it isn't clear in the word, I don't want to try to, to make it clear with my, um, my fiddling around with it. So if I don't say a lot about certain things, it's because we don't know exactly what it's going to look like. For instance, the reign of Christ during the millennium. I've read book after book with all these people saying all these things. It never found any part of it in scripture. We just don't know. So when we get to some of those spots, I'll tell you, hey, we just don't know the answer to this. and We're going to have to trust God. Is that good with everybody? Okay, let's take a moment. I'm going to ask you, like I have been recently, to take the hand of somebody or turn to someone and just give you 30 seconds to pray that your hearts will be open, that my mind will hear whatever God is telling me to say beyond what I have prepared, and that the Spirit of God would bring truth that will change our lives. Would you take 30 seconds and pray for me that way and yourselves, and then I'll close this and we'll begin. You feel free to pray out loud. <clears throat> Father, we thank you that we don't come to this word with just our minds. They're not sufficient. We need your spirit to make it come alive to us. And although this is a very basic message, Lord, I pray that inside it somewhere you will speak to the hearts of the hearers, that we would all be challenged and changed and transformed to some degree because of the words we hear knowing that these words are an expression of your heart and an expression of your character and an expression of your mind. Help us, Lord, to understand that, to know that when we speak the word, we are trying to unlock some of the mysteries of who you are. And when we do that, when we are touched by God, then life flows forth from us. May that be the case even as I speak. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. This passage now we're dealing with coming into the whole realm of the last final days before the fullness of eternity begins leading up to the millennial reign of Christ. So what I'm doing to explain this to you is starting in chapter 19 verse 17, it flows through all the way chapter 20 with the dealing with Satan, the white throne judgment and so on. The reason I'm doing that is that in the New Testament, the writings are like letters. So there's no chapters, there's no numbers and verses. It's just one flowing conglomeration of the things that God is revealing to the Apostle John as he writes. And why I do this is that it's a complete whole. And so I didn't preach the end of 19 last week because I believe it fits better with what we're speaking of today. To give you fair uh, preparation for this message. If you're a note taker, there will be five essential points that we're going to cover, and we will cover them very rapidly because they don't need a lot of comment. We'll read it and then share what we can. The first thing we will cover is the Battle of Armageddon very quickly because we touched base on it last week. Then we're going to talk about Satan and being, his being bound and cast out of the earth for a period of time. Then the millennial kingdom when Christ takes over and creates a theocracy. And then the fourth thing we'll talk is Satan is loosed for a period of time at the end of the millennium. And why that happens, we'll explain later, hopefully. And then the white throne judgment. And then I will bring to us basically two points of application. So if you're a note taker, that gets you some idea of where we're going. So now, chapter 19, verse 17, I will read it, and then we'll comment as little as we need to, because it pretty much stands on its own. This deals with the beast and the armies which Christ defeats when he comes back at the end of the Great Tribulation, what we call the Battle of Armageddon. 
Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God. There's going to be a massacre here, dead bodies laying everywhere, and these types of birds are going to come and eat the flesh. Kind of a ugly, ugly picture. Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. <clears throat> and I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, their armies gathered together to make war against him. That him is capital H, it stands for God and for Jesus Christ, who sat on the horse and against his army. So this is Jesus is coming. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast, those who are now condemned, and those who worshipped his image. These two, the Antichrist, or the, that individual, and the false prophet, were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. Now let me begin by introducing this part this way. When we read this and we see of this horrible death and this horrible destruction, we begin, some of us, particularly people who are unsaved, to think how brutal and how unjust is God. But what I want to share with anybody who thinks that way today, that if you've been with us all the way through the book of Revelation, you'll see after every difficult time, every seal, every trumpet, and every bowl of wrath, there is always a pause where the grace of God is offered to mankind. And we see after every one of those events that in the conglomeration we understand that collectively many people reject the grace of God. No matter what's going on, no matter what is happening, no matter how bad things get, sometimes the human heart is just unwilling to yield. Amen? And that's what's taking place in this context. And so now we're coming to this point at the end of the great battle of Armageddon where this destruction has occurred after seven years of God trying to bring humanity to the point of receiving Jesus Christ as Savior. So although grace is missing here, it was not missing before. And we need to understand that when grace is given, we should take it. Because there is a time when grace may not be offered to people in even this life. When we studied the book of John, remember I talked to you about those who were rejecting Christ and it says they would not believe. And then it goes down a few verses later and finally it says, and ultimately they came to the place not only would they not believe, they could not believe. And so that's what we're seeing as we introduce this section for all of us to understand. So the Antichrist then is coming after the people of God. And the Antichrist is, is beaten or captured or defeated, whatever word you choose, and is false prophet, and they're cast alive into the lake of fire. They will never get out of there. They're done. It's over for them. It also says that the worshipers of those of the false image and worship the image of the beast, they too will be defeated and killed that day. And that's when the birds come and eat their bodies. And that's a horrible picture in itself. But what happens is they're dead, but they're not dead, dead, okay? They are not cast into the lake of fire. They are cast out and go into what is known in the Bible as Hades or Sheol. Now, a lot of people think that Hades and Sheol are the same thing as hell. They are not. What you need to understand, saints, as we look at this, is that Hades and Sheol were a place where, before Christ was raised from the dead, those who died went there. If they died in the faith, they went into a place called paradise, or what is often referred to as the bosom of Abraham. They were there as spirit and soul, waiting for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If they didn't know God and they had not trusted him and had not yielded their lives to the life of God who would dwell inside of them, according to Ezekiel chapter 36, then when they died, they would go into the other side of Sheol or Hades, which is a holding place for those who would ultimately be condemned. Do not confuse that with hell, nor should you confuse that with purgatory. Purgatory does not exist. 
It's not there. I don't mean to be harsh or, or uh, unsympathetic. But this is not a place that you get out of and change your direction. If you are held in paradise, you will go to be with Jesus in heaven when the time comes. If you're held here in torment in Sheol, you will go the other direction. Now, the reality of all of this for us to understand is that Jesus had to be first in the resurrection. And not only the resurrection, but the ascension to God the Father in heaven. That's where he would dwell. Once he was raised from the dead and ascended to God the Father on high, then all those who were waiting for redemption in Sheol or in Hades, in the place of blessing, they went with him. He could not precede them. They had to wait. And so those are some of those which says in Ephesians that he took all these captives with him to heaven. They were waiting in Hades. They were waiting in Sheol until he could make that move because he was the first to be raised from the dead in that eternal state. So that's what we see here. So the battle of Armageddon has ended. Everybody is gone in that direction where they go. And when that happens, it says the next step that takes place is in Revelation 20, verse 1 through 3. Let's read that very quickly. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon. That means a violent grasping. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old who is the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years, and he cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more, till a thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. And we'll define what that is and why in just a few moments. But the first thing we need to understand is that God's angel can come and take over Satan, the evil one. That tells us that Satan's power is what? Limited. He's not so strong as we might think. And most of how he appeals to us and has power over us is through our own flesh. So this angel comes with a key to the bottomless pit, and some scriptures translate it into the abyss, not hell. He's not in hell yet because he's going to get out. Once you're in hell, you never get out. Amen? just the way it is. Unfortunately, it's what it is. But that's the way things go. So he's into this bottomless pit. The key's opened it up. He's thrown in and he's chained so he can't go anywhere. You know how we always talk about Satan's on a leash? <laughs> Satan's on a leash. Everybody say Satan's on a leash. Satan's on a leash. He can't do very much because God doesn't allow it. And then we see that we enter into the millennium. What happens is when Satan is thrown into that bottomless pit, he has no more influence in the world. Now that's pretty cool. That's, that's not going to end that way, but for a thousand years, there is no influence whatsoever. Now why is that? What's going on? I think it's first this idea that he'll be out of the way, and we're going to discover later that even with Satan out of the way, mankind has still got the same problem, doesn't he? We've got the same problem that we've always had, and that is that we are born sinners and that we need to be saved by a Savior. And when I say born sinners, that doesn't mean you've actively sinned, but you have a sin nature. You see, maybe you've never heard this before. I don't know if you have or haven't, some of you, but I'll tell you that you don't, you don't sin and become a sinner. You sin because you were born a sinner. That's the way it is. We inherited sin and the sin nature from our father and mother, Adam and Eve, going all the way back. Now you think, man, this guy's nuts. Did you know that they have just proven again through DNA, this just came out three weeks ago, they have proven that every human being that walks on the face of the earth today came from just two people. DNA has proven it over and over again. They were proven it 20 years ago. Now it is absolutely conclusive. I read the article. The scientist that made this discovery said, I didn't even want to believe it, but it's true. He says, I cannot deny the science of this discovery. That every one of us in here, we all had the same mom and dad. Did you know that? Amen. When we say we're a brother from another mother, it's true. <laughs> we really are. Our ultimate final parents were Adam and Eve. It's pretty astounding, but science keeps proving the scripture. You know, there's a, they talk about when people get to heaven, they go up to the top to figure out how everything ran and talking about all the science and everything. And the scientists will get up there with all these mysteries and what they'll find at the top of the mountain is the theologians. Yeah. 
You say, we knew it all along. That's exactly what's happening. Science is bearing out our faith. No other faith, but our faith. It's pretty astounding. So if you're here and you're someone who's doubtful and skeptical, listen hard today because these are truths that have been brought to us in the Scripture and are now being verified many times over by the power of science. And so back to the subject that we are born sinners and therefore we sin. And so Satan is out of the picture for a thousand years and there's still going to be problems because the human heart is what the human heart is. Now, he's bound. He's cast into this bottomless pit, and we see that the millennial kingdom begins. Go to chapter 20, verse 4 through 6. Verse 4 through 6 says, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. <clears throat> them as us. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus, and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. There will be a day when that will be, be happening. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished because they're going to face Jesus at the white throne judgment. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God, of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now, I don't know exactly what that means. Amen. Praise God. Uh, there's a lot of speculation of what it means for us to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. I'm going to tell you, I don't know. I've searched and I've looked and I tell you everything that I've read and everything I've seen in Scripture, I'm just not exactly clear of what that means. But I will tell you this, we will rule and we will reign and we will be regents or sub-regents, you might say, underneath our living God, Jesus Christ. Jesus will be seated on the throne. He will rule from that throne. He will establish what is known as a theocracy. If you're not a believer, if you've never heard the term theocracy, it just simply means a government that's run by God. That's all it is. That it yields itself to divine principle and divine teaching. That's what will be happening. I don't know what we will be doing. I just can't imagine myself being a judge. But if that's what God wants to make me be, then that's what I'll be. And, and, and if he makes me, I don't know. I'll, I'll be the, glad to be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. It doesn't matter to me as long as I'm with God. Amen. That's all I want. I want to be with Jesus. And if I got that, I got everything I need. Amen? Amen. So rule and reign, I don't know. Some of you guys, maybe you got a power trip going. Man, I'm going to rule and reign. Uh, go ahead. You can, you can have my spot, okay? I just want to be there with the Lord and experience his direction. And so if I have to rule and reign from some little spot over here, I'm going to be saying, could you hold on just a moment? Jesus, what am I supposed to do? I'm not going to rule and reign on my own at all. So I'm not going to speculate about what it all means and how it works. Some people say, well, we're going to be governors and we're going to be mayors and we're going to be this. I don't see that here. When it says we rule and reign, it says we rule and reign. Can everybody live with that? Okay, thank you. So that's the first step. The millennial kingdom begins. And believers who will be there, or all believers will be there, those in the tribulation, those of the Old Testament saints, and even the, 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 the risen Christians will all be there ruling and reigning with Christ. Now, go to verse 7 and verse 10 in chapter 20, and we're going to talk about Satan loosed in the final day. Now, when the thousand years have expired... Satan will be released. So the millennial kingdom comes to an end. We're getting ready to burst into eternity, which is never ending. This is going to be cool. Now, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. That means worldwide, somehow, this evil Satan is going to be allowed to come out. He's going to take the leash off for a while, and he's going to draw other nations once again to do battle with the living God. You'd think he'd learn from Armageddon that it doesn't pay off, but he just doesn't quit. Amen? It's very important. So it says, and he goes to the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. So during that millennial reign, normal, everyday, physical human beings will be replenishing the population of the earth. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. That will be Jerusalem. And fire came down. They're ready to fight. They're ready to fight. And God says, okay, 
Here it is. This is it. This is your last rebellion, Satan, and I am done. This is finished. We're finished, complete. And it says, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. I believe this literally, folks. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, that's hell, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and forever. So now we've got this picture of the Antichrist rising up in the last days of the millennial kingdom. So how is it that he is appealing to people who've been living under the theocratic direction of Jesus Christ for a thousand years? Go figure! And you think that's insane! But it's exactly what God is trying to show us. That without him, we are utterly lost. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 says that the heart is desperately wicked, de uh, de desperately wicked and deceitful. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? But God can know it. And he says, and God is the one who will test the hearts. He will test the minds and he will test the works. And you see, this heart is deceitful. This heart in me, the human heart in me, that, that spiritual fleshly heart is deceitful. It is wicked. But apart from that, I've been given the new heart in Jesus Christ. And so what he's saying is, I'm going to give humanity a thousand years without Satan bugging them. And yet at the very end, he will come out and this carnal side of mankind, this sinful nature will burst forth one more time to rebel against the living God. This is very, very serious stuff. Everybody who was born of Adam and Eve, which we all are, science has proven it. We are all born sinners. We are all born as people who are and will be separated from God if we don't know Jesus Christ as Savior. Why is that? Because God the Father sent Jesus Christ the Son to be our redemption, to be our Savior. But you have to first understand in the book of Revelation and anywhere in the scripture that as human beings, we have a sinful nature. It's what we do. It's how we live. That's what happens in our lives. And that's why we do the horrible things that we do and think the horrible thoughts that we think. It's because we are designed that way with a flaw. We have a fatal flaw in us at the moment of conception. When we are given physical life, we are also inheriting all of the issues of that life of Adam and Eve. Those who turned against God and the sin nature was born forward in them. And they became selfish and self-aware. Remember last week I talked about the fact that they were naked, but they really didn't know it because they were clothed in the glory of God. Run around naked all over the place, had no idea. Probably because they weren't really naked. They were clothed in the glory of Christ. And then when they sinned, that glory left. Then they knew that they were naked, so they covered themselves and they hid from God. The same thing goes on in mankind today. That we have this aspect in us that separates us from the living God. And we have to understand that before God we are naked the Hebrews writer says that we all are naked before God and exposed. It also says to us that how shall we survive, if we, how shall we escape if we forsake such a great salvation? There is no other way. I know the people say that that's a horrible thing to say, that Christianity is exclusive, but so is Islam, so is every other religion in the whole world. They say it's our way. The difference with us is, is science is proving what we say. Amen. And then we're seeing Jesus Christ who came and rose from the dead. And many of us in this room have seen the Lord, have met with the Lord, and that's a wonderful experience. But that doesn't save you. Salvation comes when we recognize what we are and the need we have of a Savior. You've heard my testimony many times over the years. One more very briefly. When I was a younger man, I was studying and coming very close to the Lord. And I had some things that were inhibiting me. And so I had a prayer time. And in the prayer time, I had a vision. And in the vision, there was this big black curtain. And in the vision, an angel says, why don't you just pull that curtain back and see what it is? So I pulled it back. He pulls it back, actually. I said, go ahead. And in there was every kind of sin you could conceive of. Everything. It looked like a bunch of snakes and scorpions and all these horrible things that you would think, oh my gosh, how could anybody live like that? And then the Lord said, that's you. He says, that's your heart. John, that's what you are without me. 
And I'll tell you, I started weeping and, and broke. I said, oh, God, you know, if that's what I would be without you, I don't ever want to be without you. And I was feeling all this, this fear and so on because I could see all this sinful stuff residing in my heart. He was saying, this, this veil, this curtain is a veil over your heart. I pulled it back so you could see what you really are without God. And I said, well, what do I do about it? And he brings back the vision and he pulls back the curtain. And this time it's not black. It's red. It's crimson like blood. And it's a moving curtain. And I could see all of a sudden that this curtain was like the blood of Christ pouring down. And he says, this curtain is between me and your sin. This is between us and your sin has been washed away, moved away because of my son, Jesus Christ, and his blood shed for you. That's what's going on in all of this. So as believers, we are separated from God and we are separated from him without Jesus Christ. And then he goes on and we hear this whole thing about Gog and Magog. I want to give you a simple illustration of that. People see this and they go, Gog and Magog? I thought that was at Armageddon, right? Yeah. Well, it was. But now there's another aspect of Gog and Magog. And it's like in prophecy, sometimes you see a piece of it here and then you see a piece of it further down the road. Well, that's what's going on here. I would liken it to one of the NFL football teams. And the NFL football team started way back in the 50s, I think. And some of them still got the same name. And you can turn it on and you go, well, I'm watching a team that's existed for 50 some odd years. They're all different players, but it's the same team, isn't it? So that's what's going on with Gog and Magog here. He's saying, look, it's, it's the same team. It's the same idea. It's the same mistake. It's the same sin, just different players. So it's, all of this comes forward, and they come to attack the saints and to devour the people of God. But they get the surprise of a lifetime. God strikes them down with the word of his mouth and with the power of fire, and he removes them completely from the earth. And it says then Satan is finally cast. He's violently taken, and I'm sure he would fight. He's violently taken and cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, into hell, to bother us no more. Everybody say amen. amen. So that's what happens. But there's the essential thing. Now, then comes the white throne judgment, and we're almost through. The white throne judgment is that place that everybody that is not saved meets with God. The white throne judgment is where all of the future of eternity and what your position with God in eternity will be settled. Now that's if you're an unbeliever. You see, our future in eternity has already been settled. Amen? It was settled on the day that we trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior. I had a day that I did that. I hope all of you have had or will have soon that same kind of day. When you recognize legally that you are this and you need to know God, you need to have the best attorney in the universe and his name is Jesus. And you commit yourself to him. You make the deposit. You, you say, all right, I take you as my attorney. I take you as my savior to represent me before a righteous and holy God who is your father. Now that's important because the white throne judgment is a different ball game altogether. You know, you'll find many people today in the world will say, well, I, I don't believe this stuff about Jesus and needing a savior. It's all on good works. And so I've been a good man. I'll, I'll just take my chances with God. And I'll tell him how good I've been. You know, and, and I'll compare myself to Mr. Jones over here, Mr. Smith over there, and, and, and Brother Wilson over there. And God will have to let me in. Saints, it doesn't work that way. It does not work that way. It would be wonderful if it did, but it doesn't. In fact, it wouldn't be wonderful because we couldn't complete it anyway. Because our hearts can't do that. Paul writes in Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, he says, For we know that by works of the law shall no man be justified in the sight of God. You see, to come into the presence of a holy God, you must be holy. You must be justified, which means just as if I'd never sinned. You can't do that. I can't do that. None of us can do that. But if we put our trust in Jesus Christ, he gives us his righteousness and he took our sin in himself on the tree, on the cross. He bore that away that he would die to, that we could die to sin. He would die to sin and we could live to righteousness. That's the gospel. That's the beauty of what's going to take place. And so, we won't be at the white throne judgment, saints. We will have already met our judgment with Jesus at the Bema, 
That's another judgment seat where God takes us aside, Jesus himself, and he evaluates our life and our works. And on the things that we have done, we will be blessed. The things that we've done wrong, those things will be taken away. But we will still be in the kingdom of God because we are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So what happens? Let's read this, and then I'll, I'll be out pretty quick here because i got a meeting. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. That's, that's this broken society, this broken world, this broken creation, fleeing for the very presence of the revealed manifest presence of God. And there was found no place for them. You can't hide from God. You can, you can do it all you want, but you're not hidden. He knows exactly where you are. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Notice that. There's two sets here. There's a set of books and the book of life. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. The death Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they judged each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone who... Uh, anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now let me explain this and we'll be done. And that's why I connected all this together because it's huge, but it makes a better impact if you get it all at once. At the white throne judgments, there are two sets of books. For each one of us, there will be a, a book, maybe many books, depending on how long we live, listing all of our life. Every bit of it. Every idle deed, every idle word. Everything. It'll all be recorded there because God knows all. Amen? Amen? And then on the other side of the library, as it were, there's another book. It's called the Book of Life. And so if you want to stand trial before God, I hope you don't choose that. Because you see, if your name is in the Book of Life, you won't have to give that accounting. Whoa. You won't have to do that before the Lord. But if your name is not in the Book of Life, then judge will call you to the bar. you say, all right, come on up. You wanted to tell me about your life and why I should let you into my heaven. You show me. You tell me what you have done that makes you worthy because I've been telling you for centuries that the only way to be worthy is to put your trust in God. You see, the disciples once asked Jesus, what must we do to be doing the works of God? John chapter 6, Jesus says this. I think it's in verse 29. He says to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he, meaning the Father, has sent. Yeah. And so you'll stand there with all of your deeds, all of them. And God will say, not enough. Because you see, God's standard, if you want to live by the law, is absolute perfect perfection. That's what Jesus did. That's why he is our Savior. He was born without sin, and he lived without sin, and he died for our sin and took our place. Anything less than that will not bring you into a relationship with God the Father. I don't say that to be mean. I say that to warn us all, that we need to be a people who are looking at our relationship with God. Do we have that? It's not Buddhism. It's not Islam. It's not a lot of isms and misms and gisms. It's knowing Jesus. That's the only way it happens. And realizing and believing in your heart that he was the son of God and that he was raised from the dead. If you believe that and you say, Lord, I receive you. I ask for the forgiveness of my sin. It's a done deal. It's a done deal. But you've got to make that decision. And you don't want to be one, I think, that stands before God all on your own. He's perfect. He's powerful. He's pure. And he is holy. And nothing gets into his kingdom that is anything less than perfect and powerful and holy and pure. But you see, your purity does not come because you've gone out and washed yourself or gone out and done all these good works. None of that cleanses the heart. Jesus Christ puts a new heart in everyone who puts their trust in him. And that's what you must have. And I tell you as I close, one day, if you're not a believer, you will stand before that throne. And you will be standing all alone. There won't be any neighbor running up. He was really good to me. You know, think you ought to let him in. They're not going to do that. It isn't going to happen. You will be there 
all by yourself, facing the holiest being that could ever be. And he's going to want to know, why should I let you into my heaven? And when he asked me that question, if he were to do so, I'd say, I'll tell you why. Because I trusted your son, Jesus Christ. And you cannot deny your own son who dwells in me. Anything less will not get you in. So what's the application? The application is simply this. Be ready. Hopefully, you will never stand at the white throne judgment. If you do, you're lost. You will never recover. You will be cast into the lake of fire. People don't like to hear that, but it's the truth. And I'm obligated to tell you the truth. I don't like that message myself. But the other side of that message is I can escape that fire. I can escape that hell. I can escape that judgment by a simple act of faith. Putting my trust in Jesus and say, Lord, forgive me for my sins. Give me a new life and help me begin to live for you. It's that simple. So, number one, are you ready? Have you made a decision for Jesus Christ? Are you ready if he were to call you home today? We, in the first service, we had the earthquake. It was really kind of strange. Everybody, oh, I should have given a great altar call right there, I think. <laughs> but I'll tell you right now, your time is limited. And your opportunities are limited. There is a time when God, if you refuse him and refuse him and refuse him, he will simply say, well, let's pass that one by. We won't speak to them anymore because he's never heard me and his heart tells me he is never going to hear me. That is a damnable place to be. That is a horrible place to be. I would not tamper with that. And I guarantee you that I call you so that you won't. The second thing for the saints today for application is if we know this, and we have come to Christ, don't you think we should be sharing him with others? I'm not saying that everywhere you go, you gotta be jumping on people and say, hey, you gotta come to Christ. But can you go in your daily routine and ask the Lord today, Father, would you give me an opportunity, if it's your will, that I can speak to somebody about Jesus Christ? I do that. I was in a restaurant yesterday and I praised the whole Lord God. I really wanna share my faith with somebody today. He didn't give me anybody. <laughs> But I pray that every day, and very frequently, he does. So as I close, I just want to remind you, you cannot make heaven on your own. You must go through the door. Jesus is the door. He said, I am the door. He is the truth. He must be accepted. That's what we were at. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that as believers, we will escape the white throne judgment. I don't want to be there, Lord. I put my trust in you. There's things I don't understand. Things that when I look at them, even in faith, I kind of think, oh, I don't understand how this works, Lord. But I go back to just the raw basics. Jesus. Jesus works. And he works in all of our lives. Not just to get us saved. He brings us through so many things, trials and tribulations. And I ask you, Father, today, if there is anyone in this room who has never made that decision, that they would do so today. I'm, I'm not worried if they don't for me. It doesn't embarrass me. We make this call ever so often. And they respond. Some don't. Sometimes there's nobody. But I would be remiss, Lord, if I didn't ask. And so right now, with every head bowed, every eyes closed, we did this last week and two came to Christ. Praise God. Amen. Perhaps today someone has said, man, I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to be separated forever from God. I want to be forgiven for my sin and given a new life. If there's anybody like that in here today, I'm inviting you to raise your hand. No one else is going to be watching you. Just me and God. And then if you want to pray, we'll pray as a whole church with you that you might know Jesus Christ. I'm going to give you just a moment. I never mind waiting a few moments. I see one. Praise the Lord. Okay. That's one. Anyone else? You see, it does work. The Spirit of God moves. All right, well, let's pray for this one, brother, and then uh, I'll let you go. Mm -hmm. Father, we're going to do this like we always do it, where we pray together a prayer of salvation. That means of receiving Jesus as Savior. So I ask you right now that this one who raised his hand, along with the rest of us, would pray out loud and that he would commit himself to Jesus Christ because you, Lord, want to commit to him. So the prayer goes like this. Saints, go with me. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father 
I come to you in the name of Jesus. I thank you that you gave Jesus to all of us and that he died for our sins. I believe Jesus died for my sin. I know that I am a sinner. I understand, Lord. I cannot save myself. I want to ask Jesus to be my Savior. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Forgive all my sins. And save me. Make me a vessel for God. Change my life. Change my heart and lead me every day to follow you. Thank you for saving me. And now, Father, I thank you that you had me here today and that I've made this decision. I commit myself to you and to your son in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You are dismissed.